Hello, this video is going to be about propensity score analysis in R. I'll briefly describe what propensity score analysis is, then I'll go over the actual R code used and some matching techniques, and then the specific analysis using propensity score analysis, and then I'll discuss some considerations when using this analysis. So, let's get started. To best understand what propensity score analysis is, let's first discuss just very briefly what randomized controlled trials are. They involve the random assignment of a sample of participants into two or more condition involving some treatment and control condition. It's a very effective experimental design at mitigating differences between conditions to better estimate the effect of treatment on some outcome, even when those differences are not accounted for in some way. However, with randomized control trials, they may not always be feasible and much of the available observational data might only contain non-randomized data or data where participants or observations were not randomly assigned to treatment and control conditions. When treatment has not been randomized, estimation of treatment effect is now more vulnerable to other variables impacting your results, also referred to as confounds. Now with propensity score analysis, you can also call it propensity score matching, it offers a family of methods to mitigate the impact of confounding variables and estimate treatment effect. Propensity score analysis attempts to balance a set of variables across treatments and control groups by matching similar participants between treatment and control. These variables that should be balanced are referred to as covariates. Now, why should you go through the trouble of using propensity score analysis first when treatment was not randomized and not just go straight to using regression with covariates included in the model? The problem is using with using regression analysis and ignoring covariate imbalance, it would lead to the problem of extrapolation which means you're estimating outside some scope. In other words, you're making estimations outside what the model was set up to produce, which could lead to biased results. Propensity, propensity score analysis, it attempts to medi mitigate this problem by balancing covariates between treatment and control, ultimately. Now, the data set that I'll be using will contain a list of colleges so I'm not dealing with participants anymore. Each observation is a different college. The control versus treatment group, the treatment group here will be college selectivity. And I'll actually, I'll go over this uh, when I scroll a little bit further down. Uh, the first thing is loading the data set. It's publicly available and I'll add it to the description, uh, but I already included it uh, already uploaded it. It's available in the global environment, as you can see on the right. The following code here is just data cleaning. I'm just adjusting some names, just general data cleaning. I'm creating some of the variables um, and then taking a subset, cleaning some more data cleaning. I'm adjusting the percent fields and some of the continuous vari variable fields. This isn't really too important. I, I just want to make it so that it's comprehensible. So, but what is important is to know what specifically I'm doing with the data set. So the outcome, also known as the dependent variable that I'm ultimately interested in, is median earnings of the students in a specific college after they graduate. The grouping variable my treatment or control var variable is going to be college selectivity versus non-selective colleges. And my covariates are going to be the median earnings of the college, median household income of the students in the college, the percent of, uh, the percent of uh, STEM, I think, enrollment within that college, the percent of Pell students within that college, and the percent of students who are 25 or above at that college. And so, and you can 
easily see that this isn't necessarily a, it's a different type of data set. It's not necessarily treatment or control. And I'm using propensity score analysis to isolate college selectivity to see its impact on median earnings post graduation by trying to balance these covariates here between different types of selectivity. So, so from now on, when I say treatment group, I'm referring to college selectivity and covariates, these will be my covariates. So let's start the propensity score analysis. Let me just, so this is entering, we're entering the design phase, but let me quickly review what the, what steps will be taken in this design phase. So first we'll decide what covariates we need to balance. Then you estimate the propensity scores. What is a propensity score? It's just, you're just estimating the probability of being in a treatment group using those covariates. Then when we estimate these propensity scores, we have to match on them, meaning we'll have to select some matching method to use. And then finally, we'll evaluate the balance of the covariates, meaning it, first, basically, if it's balanced, we can move on from the design phase to the analysis phase. However, it's not balanced, we'll have to start back at step number two and reestimate, make some adjustments. And, you know, it might include reestimating the propensity scores. So let's move on to the first step not all covariates need to be balanced. That's very important. Generally, the covariates you should include will be related to the treatment variable and the outcome variable. That's just a general statement. However, Zoe et al. showed that, showed, provide some specific examples and specific paths between the covariates, your treatment variable and your outcome variable, that if you have some specific content knowledge or a full understanding of the data that you can actually employ. Now, um, the goal is to ultimately the goal is to attempt to balance the covariates uh, related to selectivity, which which is my treatment. Now, right here. So right here, I just wanted to check to see whether these covariates that I selected are significantly related to selectivity. So I'm using some logistic regression model here. And all I wanna know is whether these covariates are significant predictors of selectivity, which is my grouping variable. And I'm using logistic regression because it's one or zero, there's only two groups. Um, next here, I also wanna know if those same covariates are significantly related to the actual ultimate outcome that I want to know, median earnings. And I'll run, and this is just linear regression. So I'll run that as well. And I just want to see whether these variables are, and this is just a general way of doing it. And I'll just scroll up and I'm looking for the asterisks on the right hand side indicating that these variables, all the variables are indeed significantly related to selectivity and also significantly related to the outcome variable, median outcome. So basically I'll use these in the uh, propensity score analysis. So now moving on to the actual propensity score analysis, we're focusing on propensity score analysis with two groups, a control and a treatment group. And again, the package we'll be using it is match it. So let's actually enter that. Let's run it. So the first matching method that we'll be using is nearest neighbor matching. I basically I also included some specific arguments that you can add to the um, to the actual uh, to the actual function, so but let's go over that. So so the function here is match it, and right now I'm entering the formula, which is your grouping variable, your treatment grouping variable. In this case, it's selectivity, 
and my covariates after the tilde you're entering your covariates sim similar to before when you're using the lm or glm function to look at predictivity uh, now the data set again i'm setting it to call to that's the um, data set that i used post data cleaning data set now distance i'm setting to glm for logistic regression this is to calculate actually calculate the propensity score now again propensity score is just the probability of being in a specific treatment you can use there are a number of other analyses you can use you can use artificial neural nets i think you can there's um i think there's a random forest available in this i believe so there's other ways to calculate the probability of being in a treatment effect in this case right now uh, the most commonly used is logistic regression so and i think also this is actually just the default anyway so you don't necessarily have to set it now the method there are multiple methods and the one i'll be using is nearest neighbor matching and the i'm setting the order to largest i believe this is also the default and the actual let me just sorry this mouse is a little sensitive yeah so yeah so but first what what is nearest neighbor matching so each treatment participant is paired with a control participant with the closest propensity score each pairing is done one at a time without much consideration of how it could impact the other pairings so it's kind of like and it's referred this is generally referred to as a greedy algorithm and that's why this other argument here, m dot order, is actually somewhat meaningful. It's indicating you're starting from the largest propensity score to this, then to the smallest in the descending order. This argument here, replace is equal to false. It's uh, it's basically saying, can I use another observation to for another match after I already used it, or can I just it's just is it just one and done uh, match pairing or not? some other um let's actually let's actually run it real quick and then i'll discuss some other arguments and this will so what it does is it runs logistic regression to generate the propensity scores and the matching technique will be nearest neighbor right now i just ran the model and uh i just basically if you model uh what is set to is psa underscore n and if you run that it'll just briefly describe what you did which which is what i just mentioned um and now let's actually look into it sorry for that that was my dog but so we just ran the summary function for the analysis um that we conducted the propensity score analysis. So I'm scrolling to the top and now we'll review the actual output. So the first set of data is the summary balance for all the data. So this is, gives you an, an initial idea of how balanced the data are for across all the covariates and the propensity score, the distance right here. Now the second set of data is the summary balance for just the data you were able to match. and so now let's review actually yeah let's review each column so the first two columns are just the mean for the groupings mean of the treated and the mean control the next few columns go over the actual balance indicating how indicating whether the data or those specific covariate is balanced or not so this is the standardized mean difference the variance ratio and the empirical cumulative distribution functions this uh, this right here the standardized mean difference and the empirical cumulative distribution functions you want to see values close to zero this would suggest good balance for the variance ratio you want to see it more close to one uh, this right the final column right here however this shows basically this sh should also be close to zero and it shows you how close the pairings are or between like how far apart or how close these pairings are and you want to see them to, like uh, as little or as close as possible and this would be uh, at, at a zero 
right over here some more descriptives is the percent of balance improvement and right here gives you a, just a general control uh, the entire sample uh, for the entire sample all you can see the number in the control and treated and then you can see which ones were actually paired so this was one-to-one -one matching so you'll see an equal number in the control and treated right here and the ones that we were not able using the nearest neighbor matching on the propensity scores to match are categorized as unmatched right here so so a few things to note if i haven't mentioned nearest neighbor matching is sensitive to the actual order so that should be considered and you can try and adjust it in addition you can add an argument the calipers to set the limit or, or it's basically a level of tolerance uh, of how much between the treatment and control so like uh and w one suggestion you can set it to it's an argument you can add to the function you can set it to either 0.2 or 0.25 standard deviations now with actually adding a caliper you can reduce uh, the actual estimation bias but you might actually lose more to participants or observations meaning uh, more of them might be unmatched so you can t basically just tweak this um, and see what more you can do with it now another type of match now uh, before i move on so the i just ran through the balance uh and i'll cover balance further in a um in a just a bit i just want to go over the actual matching methods then i'll go more in depth into balancing so the next matching method is optimal pair matching now so uh so right here um again match it so i'm just setting the method to optimal now i'm also setting ratio to two to one so the control to treatment ratio meaning instead of using one to one now i'm using two to one meaning i can actually start to use more of my data especially when they're much more in the control group than the actual treatment group now with optimized pair matching uh, it's different from nearest neighbor matching because it considers all propensity score differences between treatment and control pairs and matches based on the smallest distances so we, it looks through the various dis distances so it's more optimal and not greedy as before meaning it, it does consider what the specific matching how it, like is it the best one um, or is it this other matching should be done in order to, you know think two two or three steps ahead so you have the most option optimal pairings uh, between all the participants now uh, in addition this uh, should also note that this also requires an additional package to run um, uh, if you've already uh, installed I, I believe it's called optmatch uh, I believe uh, it, that it should also require that uh, package as well but let me just run it um, but it's a different uh, different type of method not as sensitive uh, and it might just take a few seconds and you'll see right here um, like the actual matchings that were done uh, were a lot more and it's indicating here it's two to one optimal pair matching propensity scores how it was estimated again um, and we don't have to go into the summary uh, but now let's move on to optimal full matching also referred to as just full matching they're they're the same thing so what what it does it put it puts all participants or observations into these subclasses where each subclass contains at least one treated uh, and one control participant or observation and with in uh, and means within each subclass uh, the propensity score differences are, are minimized uh, in addition there is the additional estimate argument that you can add now certain types of matching methods you can estimate different types of treatment effects 
the ones before, there, there are three main types, uh, average treatment effect of the treated, average treatment effect of the controlled, and average treatment effect. Uh, this determines whether you can interpret the treatment effect for the entire sample, which is with average treatment effect, or just interpret the treatment effect for the participants or observations that receive treatment, um, or interpret the treatment uh, for only those who are in the control group. Some matching methods like nearest neighbor and optimum uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, optimum matching um, that it does not allow for average treatment effect but full matching does so and generally speaking um, most times you'll be interested in the average treat it depends like uh, most people are compared to average treatment effect of the treated versus average treatment effect of the controlled you're generally more interested in the average treatment effect of the treated but uh but one of the advantages with full matching is it allows you to interpret treatment effect for the entire sample and let's actually run it right here And in addition, uh, as again, like I mentioned earlier, we're not we're using the whole data set. We're not l losing uh, as many um, and as many participants anymore because we're not so much interested in pairings, but the subclasses that are optimized. Now, now that we ha ran three different types of matching techniques, let's try and compare them. And like, as we discussed before, the uh, balancing criteria, the two of them being the standardized mean difference and the variance ratios. So we're specifically going to set a range for standardized mean difference between negative 0.1 and positive 0.1. And the variance ratio, uh, we want it as close to one as possible. So we're setting it between 0.8 and 1.25. So any of the covariates that fall out of this range would be in balance. Now to let's, uh, you should also have the, this is a separate package. Um, you should have the COBOL package installed. So I'm just going to run library COBOL to um, load it to the global environment. And what this, the following function here is the love.plot. What it does is it will take, it will look uh, I'll visualize each one of the my models the PSA underscore n that's you know that's the propensity score analysis for nearest neighbor um, this is for my OPM and this is for my full matching um, uh, yeah so and the um, specific stats again that I'm looking for is the standardized mean difference in the variance ratios I'm setting the grid is equal to true and I'm setting the thresholds again for for my standardized mean difference, which is m is equal to 0.25, and my variance ratio is equal to 1.25. So now let's run the first one for nearest neighbor matching. And as you can see on the right hand side, the covariate balance. So the red dots we're not so much concerned with, that's pre adjustment. Um, so we're more interested in these um, teal-ish dots. I believe that's the color, or blue dots. There, we're looking at the blue dots, and we're checking to see if they fall within the line. So the first table over here on the left is my standardized mean difference, and the second one um, is the variance ratio. And we want all these covariates we're interested in the covariates falling within these grid lines these dotted lines that we set up and we what we want to see is the blue lines fall into them and as you can see neither all the covariates are in balance using nearest neighbor matching now let's now let's look at the um, our second matching technique with the optimum uh, uh, optimal uh, full matching is the 
I don't know why I keep saying optimum. It's a optimal <laughs> full matching. Uh, it's so now now we're looking at it again as you can see it, it didn't fare much better because a lot of the blue dots did not fall into our grid line uh, you know some of them uh, one of them came close percent pell sort of came close um to being balanced post propensity score matching now let's check out the full matching let's run that and let's see what happens now with the full matching it starts to it starts a lot of a couple of them do start to fall you can see median household income income at least appears balanced based on the standardized mean difference um, you know but that's pretty much it a little closer but not all that much better so what do you do when you still after you've done your propensity score analysis and matching you still realize that you still see uh, this imbalance across the covariates. Now, there's a few ways to um, go about uh, improving this. Uh, just one way is to also account for nonlinear terms. So you want to introduce some quadratic terms to your model and estimate your propensity score analysis again. Um, you can also include interaction uh, interaction terms as well and and that's what i'm going to do here again so and this is this is what i'm doing is i'm ultimately i'm just trying to account for non-linearity and, and see whether that actually improves the balance or not and again um if i did not review it, this is the same model uh for full matching my method is set to full distance logistic regression and what I'm ultimately estimating is the average treatment effect, which you can adjust for full matching. Um, so let's run it again. And now let's visualize the balance to see if it fared any better. And for the most part it did. Um, the balance seemed to work a, a lot better for almost all of them except for the um, uh, undergraduate population 25 or above percentage uh, that did not seem to balance so uh, yeah so what I would try to do I was I would continue try to modify it till everything is balanced though uh, though there's been many investigations comparing uh, well that's regarding picking a method so there I introduced a few methods so you might be wondering okay which method is the best one which one is um, should I be picking uh, one thing you need to note is that you can always add arguments to adjust each method because uh, each one of them is a little different so you can always improve um, though there's some investigations like uh, some people heavily favoring the full matching um, there have been a bunch of comparison studies as well uh, but ultimately again you know you can always uh, add these additional arguments and adjust a specific matching technique uh, and overall um, th so that's why it becomes a little difficult to compare now uh, yeah, overall uh, there's so many things that impact the balance uh, for example, I could go back in. Um, I didn't. Need, I skipped over missingness. Like you can, you can have missing data. You may want to. Uh, you you actually should be doing that. Is uh, but I could do a whole separate video on missing data. Uh, ba uh, basically, impute it in some way. Um, you can change the uh, estimation propensity score technique. Maybe not use. Maybe not use logistic regression could add more quadratic terms. So, uh, and in addition, when uh, you're introducing these nonlinear terms, or you, the more knowledge you have of the data or things uh, specific nonlinearity you want to pick up, the the more easily it becomes. But, um, but it's ultimately just always no, there. Um, I might have some. I, I'm there might be some indication that full matching is pretty good, but you might want to consider. Uh, other um, adjustments as well like I wouldn't get too stuck on, on full matching now so we ultimately now we finally in our design phase but let's just assume like we have good enough balance and 
um, using the model, uh, which is uh, PSA underscore F2. And let's just stick with this. And this is the propensity score analysis, including the quadratic terms. So, and let's run with it. Uh, so now that we're done with uh, the, the, if we have perfectly balanced data in the design phase, you can finally exit out the design phase and enter the analysis phase and actually apply your uh, propensity, uh, use your regression analysis that applies weights developed from your propensity uh, score analysis that we use for full matching, um, which is based on the uh, clusters or subclasses that were um, created. So, and this is how to apply your propensity score uh, to, to create your propensity score full uh, match weighted regression analysis. Now, also one thing to consider, uh, one thing you should be doing too is you should not leave the design phase. Uh, you shouldn't basically go ahead into the analysis phase, estimate your average treatment effect, and then go back in, not like it and want to improve it, and then go back into your design phase. Uh, it sh the design phase should be kept separate from the analysis phase. Uh, so that it sort of help and improve the accuracy of the estimation. So, and right now we're in our, we've decided to go with the propensity score analysis. And to apply it, we're going to use LM, the LM function. Um, this is our outcome variable, ultimately the outcome we're most interested in. This is our grouping variable. And these are all the covariates uh, that we're going to be using. And the data set right here, we're getting from the propensity score analysis using the match.data um, uh, to, to actually get the data set. Uh, in this data set, it will, it will come with the weights in one of the columns. So basically the same data, but uh, it'll also include the weights. And this is what I'm referring to here. Um, the weights uh, is the uh, weights column used uh, in the data set, the column of weights in the data set. And let's name this model number one. So, so let's go, let's go right here. So right here, this is our average um, treatment effect right here, uh, the actual uh, estimate uh, for selectivity. Um, and this is ultimately what we're most interested in, uh, what we should be interpreting. And we can see here that it's significant, right? So, and, and we can see here, it's like about uh, 3.4. Um, what, what this means for every unit uh, increase, uh, it goes up by uh, the dependent variable or the median earnings go up by 3.4. Um, and I believe we, for 3.4 would be $3,400 uh, in, in the post graduate, uh, post earnings after graduation would go up $3,400 for being in, for graduating from a selective versus non-selective college. And, and this is controlling for all the other uh, covariates in the model um, and using the propensity score weights as well. Now, what would we have gotten if we just went to, if I didn't go through this whole process of propensity score analysis and balancing uh, what uh, using the old data, and this is just, well, th this isn't actually uh, an exact comparison because I'm not introducing the nonlinear terms, but you know, if you were just to go into it, uh, just do the regression analysis, uh, this is also referred to as uh, analysis of covariance, meaning when you have a continuous dependent variable uh, and you have a one grouping variable that you're interested in, treatment versus control, and a number of covariates. If your regression model re resembles this, uh, then, then it's the special case uh, referred to as analysis of covariance. Um, that, that's all analysis covariance is, is just a special case of regression analysis. So let's, you know, we, you can just peek at it and just look at it uh, to see. And for the most part, uh, it's a little higher. Um, so 
so the well yeah again but it's not necessarily a one for one comparison I, I i can just run this uh inter if you're interested in you you can look at it but it's um uh but I, I would expect it to be just it could just be a little higher um uh, but uh you know it, it's good to also just consider it um now i just went over just only three matching techniques uh there are a bunch of other matching methods one of them being a uh, subclass you can um, with subclassification like the propensity scores are just divided into these quantiles and the weights are um, determined based on the uh, subclasses in them now with the full matching uh, it was it's a bit more optimal um, in that the within uh, distances uh, differences uh, are actually uh, reduced uh, much more so it's optimal uh, with Another type of matching, now we're stepping out of propensity score matching. Um, you can also do something called exact matching, which is you're matching on exact values of what you're interested in. So if, let's just say there's an, a participant age 17 in treatment, you're, you're we're matching to uh, a participant age 17 in control. Uh, and and as you can tell, this kind of gets a little wonky when you have a lot of variables. And the, the, that's the beauty of propensity score analysis or, or propensity scores. It reduces this issue of dimensionality. So if you have a ton or a bunch of variables or covariates you want to match on, it, it becomes an issue uh, referred to as dimensional, higher dimensionality. And what propensity scores is just reduces it down into this one value and you you're left to reason that one participant in the treatment group with a specific propensity score um, is can be matched to a uh, someone from the control group with the same propensity score now now another variation of this is coarsened exact matching which allows for a little bit more flexibility by introducing some sort of uh, some groupings within each variables before matching. Another type of matching technique is genetic matching. So matches are made uh, with this generalized Malnobis distances containing weights. These weights are estimated by a genetic search, a genetic search algorithm, algorithm, which determines importance of covariates uh, in achieving uh, in achieving balance. I'm so sorry with the spelling. Yeah, I, I noticed some spelling errors too. Just uh, this this is what happens when uh, you know you don't use uh, you rely so heavily on spell check. Um, but yeah. So uh, yes, but these are some other ones, and and I could do what's part two to this video and to go over. Um, some other, uh, I can go over these um, in another video, uh, and, uh, and there's also some other things I may have skipped uh, in this video. But lastly, just some considerations. So what I used is a may have been like a pretty peculiar example because it's not a traditional treatment versus control, and you can, you know, you should be encouraged to use this type of uh, analysis uh, for data that not may not be, uh, you know, uh, traditional treatment or control. However, you have to know that it has to be theoretically, at least theoretically possible. Uh, I believe I should probably have a citation for this, but uh, there was like this one example, like let's say I used something like assigning students, I'm, I'm taking this example from this article, but uh, I was, uh, in my propensity score analysis, my treatment is graduation, right? And, and as you can tell, assign, assigning students to a graduation versus non-graduation group, you, you know, you, you can't necessarily assign students to uh, actually graduate. So it's if it's not even theoretically possible. So maybe that's an example of something you shouldn't do with propensity score analysis. In addition, uh, another thing you should be doing is accounting for the missing data in some way. Um, uh, which I can do in a whole separate video uh, going over what to do with missing data. Uh, another consideration is potential confounders not included in the model. Now, with randomized control trials, why they're so great is that even for variables you're not necessarily including in the model, they're pretty good at 
uh, they're pretty good at balancing uh, the uh, not balancing but uh, they're not as impacted by these confounders not included in the model uh, so in this case however propensity score analysis might be more sensitive to it um, therefore there are these uh, other sensitivity analyses and and maybe I can go uh, in depth in that in some other video as well, uh, how to use these sensitivity analyses. And lastly, one thing you should also consider is propensity score matching. Uh, it's a matching method, but it may not always be the best matching or it may not be the overall the best analysis when you're when you have randomized data when treatment was not randomized. Uh, for example, let's just say uh, the let let's say you have a, a a grouping or a treatment that was given out. Um, let's say it's a drug, and the uh, healthcare provider didn't want to just want to give it out randomly. Let's say they I, I ethically I can only give this out to or I want to only give this out to people who have really high pain on some uh, metric, right? who indicated uh, to have very high pain. Uh, in this case, because a cutoff was used, it wasn't randomized. Treatment versus control were not randomized, but it was only participants who indicated higher levels of pain were used and a cutoff was used for the group. Uh, a more appropriate analysis might be that that uh, takes that into consideration and is built around it is regression discontinuity. Um, and, and that might be a better fit uh, instead of just jumping into matching. So you, you might want to consider whether um, or regress, what, consider why, what uh, is going into uh, the actual treatment and control group uh, division. Uh, how was it set up? Okay, so thank you so much for sticking through this. Propensity score analysis, you can do like an entire course on it and I and I know I missed out on some things but the purpose was to just go over the R code and um, just general description and maybe just like a refresher of people already familiar with it so I hope you liked the video and I hope you found it useful take care everyone